The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Um, our next talk will be from one of these uh, bright young people. Uh, graduate student Gwen Rudy, who's one of our senior graduate students, uh, who'll be telling us about observing the epoch of galaxy formation. Gwen. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today to tell you um, about some work that I'm doing as part of my thesis with my advisor, Chuck Seidel, um, as well as a number of other graduate students, um, two of which will be uh, giving you posters later to tell you about some of the work that they've done themselves. Um, I've had the great privilege of using the Keck Observatory for a large amount of the data that I was, was needed to uh, finish my thesis. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about how we go about observing the epoch of galaxy formation using this Keck data. So if we were to make a plot of the activity rate of the universe, it would look something like this, where we're plotting the rate at which the universe forms stars as a function of its age, where we start at very early times, right after the Big Bang here, and today is plotted right here. Um, Richard was talking about redshift earlier, so that's how that is cor uh, corresponds. And Richard just told you about sort of the earliest times, the cosmic dawn. Now instead, what I'm gonna tell you about right now, the work that I've been doing for my thesis, focuses instead on this most active time when the universe was forming stars most prolifically. Now this is a really important time in the history of the universe because a large fraction of the stars that we observe in the present universe were actually formed during this period. And also, a lot of the properties of galaxies that we can see in the current universe were actually set during this early period. And so we have to look back in time about 10 or 11 billion years when the universe was two or three billion years old and ask questions about what these galaxies looked like, how they were forming, and how they were evolving. So Richard told you that we go out and we look for missing galaxies to find them. Um, so we look in, in the case of the, the survey that I'll talk about, we look for galaxies where we can see them in red light, see them in green light, and we, they seem to be missing or very, very faint in blue light. And that tells us that they're at this early time that's very interesting for us to study. Now Chuck and some of his former students, as soon as they found these galaxies, went out and they took a spectrum. So they dispersed the light like a prism to look at its constituent parts. Now with spectra like this, um, taken with the Keck telescope with the LRES instrument, you can get um, a lot of information about these galaxies. So for instance, we can measure very precisely their distance away from us. Um, in addition to that, we can learn something about the chemistry in inside these systems. So here, you see a number of features in the spectra of these galaxies um, from various different elements. Now this is really interesting because when the universe was very, very young, right after the Big Bang, all we had was hydrogen and helium. And these heavier elements were all formed in the cores of stars. And so when we see these kinds of elements in the spectra of galaxies, and especially in these kinds of spectra where these, uh, these features actually come from gas, not from stars themselves, then we know that a generation of stars has formed and exploded and enriched the surrounding gas with these kinds of tracers. So this is a tracer of sort of the past formation, uh, the past history of the formation of stars in these systems. Now, in addition to, to that information, we can also learn something about how much gas is actually in these systems and the motions of the gas with respect to the stars. Now, that was really, really interesting because what was found was that there's these very strong winds that are coming out of these galaxies, ejecting an enormous amount of mass sometimes more than the amount of mass that is actually formed into stars in these systems. So that brings me to the central idea of my talk, the cosmic gas cycle. So if we're interested in understanding the formation and evolution of galaxies, everything in the universe that emits light started out as gas. So we have to be able to trace gas coming in to galaxies and what happens, what the galaxies do with that gas um, once it gets in. So the picture that we have is that gas comes in from intergalactic space. It flows into the concentrations of mass in the universe. And once it gets in one of these galaxies, it can form stars. And what we found is that the process of forming stars is actually very, very energetic. 
and it, it injects a very large amount of energy into the gas that surrounds these young stars. And what actually happens is that energy can push the gas out of these galaxies. So here we have a local galaxy. This is where you'd see all of the stars. And what we see in this, these red filaments are is actual gas and dust being pushed out of the system by the energetics of star formation. Now this gas, when it comes out, can actually mix with other gas in intergalactic space and fall back in to these galaxies. And that can be quite interesting because these, um, these outflowing mass elements have different chemical composition. And so when they fall back into a new galaxy, you have a new generation of stars that are formed that have a different composition than the previous set. It's also interesting because, like I said, everything in the universe that emits light comes from this gas. So if you can deprive a galaxy of cold gas to form stars from, it won't form stars anymore. And so we need, so if in the local universe, when we look around, we see galaxies that form fewer stars on average than galaxies um, at earlier times. And it's one of the ways to explain this is to deprive somehow galaxies of cold gas to form stars. So this idea of the cosmic gas cycle is actually very fundamental to our understanding of how galaxies form and how they evolve. So for my thesis, we were interested in studying this idea. And what we had to do was go out and find a way to find gas around very, very distant galaxies. Now that turns out to be really tricky because gas doesn't really emit a whole lot of light. We can't go out and, and see the light itself from this gas. So instead what we had to do was go out and look for its shadow. So um, the, the survey that was performed for my thesis was we went out and we found a whole bunch of galaxies and got spectra of them very much like the LRED spectra that I showed you earlier. So that's what I'm showing here, all of these various galaxies. And we looked in the same regions of the sky that were known to have very, very bright background sources. Um, some of the most luminous, intrinsically luminous objects in the sky, quasars. Um, so quasars are, are enormous black holes sitting at the centers of galaxies that are eating gas around them. And this process produces a tremendous amount of light. And so these are very, very bright objects. And we can use them as cosmic flashlights to look at what lies between this quasar and ourselves. And so what we do is we look for missing light at the same locations as these galaxies. And we can see from that missing light the gas distribution around these structures. And so when we get a very large number of galaxies that lie in front of these very, very bright quasars, we can build a picture of what the gas looks like around these galaxies. So in order to look at the quasars, we use another instrument on Keck, the HiRes instrument. And with this, these are uh, examples of some of the data we get. Um, and with this kind of data, we can get very precise measurements of the content of gas surrounding these galaxies. Also, the chemical composition of that same gas, which again is interesting because if we see elements like carbon and oxygen, we know that has to have come out of a galaxy, a place where stars were forming. We can see the motions of gas surrounding these galaxies, which is again very interesting because we can see gas falling into these galaxies that'll form a future generation of stars, and we can see gas coming out of these galaxies. We can also measure things like the temperature of the gas, um, which is interesting for understanding what kind of physical mechanisms actually cause this gas to come out of these galaxies. But if we're interested in understanding um, on a more fundamental level what is actually causing this gas to be pushed out, we need to be able to know more fundamental properties, physical properties of the galaxies um, that we're looking at the gas around. And to do that, what we really want are spectra of the, the optical light emitted by these galaxies, which due to the, um, the evolution of the universe is actually shifted into the near infrared. And so I was very privileged to be part of the MOSFIRE team, um, which built a new multi-object near infrared spectrograph for Keck. Uh, this is a picture of it right here, actually right across the street about this time last year, right before we shifted to Hawaii. I'm very happy to report it's on the telescope and it's working really well. It's been a very exciting time to be part of this group. Um, and indeed, this is some of the first data, one galaxy in one of these fields. And indeed, this data is perfect for studying things like the star formation rate of the galaxy, the mass of the structure, as well as its chemical enrichment. So this brings me back to the, the idea of the talk. We're really still at early times in terms of understanding um, the full breadth of this cosmic gas cycle and how it affects the formation and the evolution of galaxies. 
But my main point is that the Keck Observatory has really been truly fundamental um, in our understanding of these ideas um, through its wonderful, wonderful suite of instruments like HiRes, the new MOSFIRE, and LRES. Thank you very much.